Hello and welcome back to my computer vision channel. Today we will be reading the source code for the grounding dyno model. This is the second video about grounding dyno. My previous video just talks about the model itself, about the algorithm, and today we will focus on the actual source code. First, we'll take a quick look at the Jupyter notebook that can be used to download the model, to apply the model to a source image like this one, and uh, get the prediction, in this case, referring, referencing a ship most to the right. Then we'll just go ahead and start debugging what is going on here, stopping at the predict function, which basically just applies the model, takes out the bounding box and logit predictions and converts them to the actual phrase you see uh, annotated on the image in the bounding box. Uh, then we'll look at the actual forward method for the model itself, the one that basically applies the torch model uh, and we'll look at all the major components of that one. So how the backbone input is fed into the transformer, how the so-called cross-modality feature enhancer works, language guided query selection, cross-modality decoder, and finally getting the prediction out of the model. First, let's discuss how to set everything up. So this is the uh, original repository for the grounding dyno model. Uh, you should just clone that and follow the installation instructions here. Um, I use Miniconda for dependency management. So I just create a new uh, Conda environment and then install everything in there. And basically the main thing you will have to do is pip install minus E. It does two things. First of all, it downloads all the dependencies and makes the code and the model available in your system. Second, uh, since you are installing the repository that you have just downloaded, if you just debug through the code, you would actually be debugging through the files already on your computer. So you might make modifications, insert print statements in the model and so on, which is really convenient if you are doing deb debugging. Uh, and finally, just downloading the weights uh, to, to have the actual model. Another thing that I do is I initialize a, a Jupyter notebook uh, right in the root of the repository, which means that I can now basically import all the stuff from the repo and just read through the code, debug through the code, and so on. So this is the Jupyter notebook as well. Uh, don't worry, I will provide it in the description. It is relatively straightforward. We just um, import some stuff from the grounding dyno, to load the model, uh, annotate uh, an image, and so on. Uh, then we make sure that we have GPU available, um, load the actual model that we have just downloaded. So in here, I'm using the Swin Tiny variant, which is not really that performant. Maybe I should have gone for, for the one that is um, slightly better. Um, then we have our image. So the image, the easiest way to get an image is to just go to the Coco dataset. Um, and you can maybe just find the sort of images you are interested in. Uh, and I'm using the one that frequently comes up in the paper, uh, in different papers, with a man, uh, a sheep, and a dog. Let me just quickly find it. Um, yeah, this is the one. This is the image. You can get the URL for the actual image itself here. And I can just view it in VS Code. Uh, and yeah, it's a nice image because we can test our reference expressions. Um, so for example, ship most to the right. Uh, let me put in something that actually works here. So uh, I do this, uh, and then I just use this predict method. And the final one, annotate, also comes from the ground in Dino. So I just launch this one, and then annotated image contains this ship with annotations. Uh, and as you can see, it also managed to correctly identify the ship most to the right. So a couple comments here. First of all, we have some thresholds. Um, like original Dino and the whole family of data like models proud themselves of on not having any parameters like thresholds, non-maximal suppression, and so on. So it's a bit annoying to have to do that again. Uh, and then box threshold basically uh, selects 
which sort of boxes we even consider for um, detection. Um, and you can set it lower and just see, like, I don't know, uh, for that we probably need a different plot, uh, prompt, like a dog, a shape, a glass, a car. So this is the sort of prompt that the grounding dino expects. So first of all, grounding dino always predicts basically which tokens to highlight and which of them correspond to the actual prediction. So you cannot just ask it, hey, what do you see on the image? You can, you should provide the answer in the prompt itself. And if you are interested in detecting several objects, you can uh, just list all of them uh, separating by the dot. So let, let's just see how it looks like. So yeah, let, right now it's a total mess because I've set the box threshold to an extremely low value. Let's go slightly higher. Okay, well, we can see that, you know, definitely have some detections that should not be there, like a glass, a car, and so on. And then if we go even higher, then it's it's a bit different now, right? So right now it fails to detect a sheep, a man, and so on, but does detect a dog because it's really it's really sure that the dog is there. So unfortunately, this is what you have to do with the grounding dyna model. Um, for your specific task, the correct way to do that would probably be to just uh, experiment on these thresholds and see what works for your specific data set. If you have a data set, if not, then just you know modify it uh, and see the result. And then the text threshold controls which tokens to highlight. So if we just set that to some low value, we can see what happens. Um, so yeah, like with the low value, we can see that it is now only detecting objects that you wanted, but uh, it, when selecting the actual text for, for the annotation frame, it is now too relaxed. So this ship here is described as a dog, a ship, a glass, a car, all at the same time. And then again, if you make it slightly stricter, you would have slightly less side effects. Let's go in stricter. And now it's better. So this one is a sheep, a dog. Uh, so again, a bit annoying, but with some experimentation, you can get it to work. Finally, let's take a look at this predict function. So what does it actually do? And since I already have everything installed, since I have downloaded the repository, what I can do is I can just put a breakpoint right here, go back to my Jupyter notebook and click debug cell. And here I am. I've stopped at the um, very beginning of the function. So we can just scroll through and see what is happening at every point. So for example, this preprocess caption thingy probably just removes some punctuation and the symbols you don't want to pass to your model. For us, it didn't do didn't do much. Yeah, and just transfer models to the device that I need. Um, and then I call the model, right? Uh, so as you can see, the actual input to the model is an image and a caption. So uh, we have this uh, weird syntax because models typically expect a batch dimension. Uh, so you have, you have to pass a list of lists, basically, not just a caption. Um, but you can also see that we are not doing tokenizing explicitly before passing to the model. So tokenizer is part of the model itself. Um, and then the prediction, let's take a look at that one. So it consists of predicted logits and predicted boxes. So boxes are bounding boxes. Uh, let's just take a look at the first one. 
right? So just four numbers uh, and the first number, yeah. Uh, so for every box we have four numbers and then there will be um, exactly 900 of them, right? So we have 900 queries in Grounding Dino, which gives it the potential to predict 900 uh, different objects. So in, in, in previous models like Dino, there would be an explicit no object class that is usable um, for the model to say that, you know, I'm not predicting anything here, I'm just stopping, you know, don't, um, I'm not going to predict phantom objects. Uh, in Grounding Dino, that is not the case, uh, which is exactly why we need this box threshold to filter out objects that are not supposed to be there. Right, uh, and then the second one, logits. There's also 900 of them. And then uh, the final dimension is 256. So to five, to, to 256 actually means the maximum allowed sequence length for the caption uh, that you have provided. In our case, the caption is actually much smaller. It, because like most of them are just padding, uh, our caption is quite small. Um, so what we'll do next is we just apply the mask. So we basically select only those predictions that satisfy this first threshold called box threshold, thus removing objects that we think are phantom from uh, the consideration. Then we get this tokenizer out of the model. We tokenize the caption um, because uh, logits, uh, predicted logics, the output of the model, they provide probabilities for every token. Uh, so we have to tokenize our text now. And so uh, what we do next is we basically iterate over those tokens that the model predicted uh, and convert them to phrases, right? So, yeah, and this is this method here. So let's see what we have. So we have logits, which is a tender of shape six by 256, right? So only six out of 900 objects made it through the box threshold. Then what we do is we have this separate text threshold, um, and then we iterate over all of these logits. So now every logit has um, 256 predictions. We can see that most of them are zero because that was just padding. The model explicitly zeroed it out because it does not correspond to uh, the actual text. Um, and then some of them are not zeros, but are quite small which usually means that the model is really not detecting anything here. Uh, by not detecting, I mean that provided this uh, prompt here, uh, and let's say that we are talking about this first object, first prediction, right? So it's actually a ship, and how the model uh, describes that is the four coordinates for the bounding box, and then 256 probabilities for the input text, only, only like first 10 of them corresponding to the actual text, the rest being zeros. But then it will be close to zero for tokens corresponding to a dog, a glass, a car, and so on. And it will be significantly non-zero for a ship, which is probably what we see here, right? A ship, uh, that's probably two tokens. Let me just confirm that. Um, and then we pass that to this get phrases from postmap function. Actually, yeah, this one. So we iterate over all the logits. We compare the logits with the text threshold, which is 0.35 in our case. So we remove all the predictions that have really low probability. And then let's just go to this function as well and see what happens here. So now this one basically says which tokens uh, passed the threshold. Um, and then we have to convert this 
Boolean tensor with true and false to the actual phrase, right? So we get tokenizer IDs, uh, we get uh, which IDs here are non-zero, we get token IDs from there, and then we decode that. And the result of that is a dog, right? So I was I was wrong, sorry, this, uh, this particular object was referring to a dog, right, this one. Because obviously they don't have to go left, right, uh, the model, um, does not do that. So the last thing I wanted to show regarding this notebook is, uh, is to how do you create prompts. So as I've said before, you have to provide an answer in the prompt itself. You cannot just ask, hey, you know, what's in the picture. You have to just write down what you expect to see. Uh, it can be just a list of objects uh, separated by a dot. So you can just bring, uh, list out all the 80 Coco classes like that, and then the model will basically perform OCO detection. Um, you can also refer to something um, that was not seen as an object before. So for example, you can ask a head of a man, for example. And let's see what is happening. And we can see that there is two predictions. One is indeed a head, and then the second one is the whole body of a man. Um, another thing you can do is refer to something like most to the right, for example, a sheep most to the right. And here you can see a sheep. Um, and let's try with the left. No, it's still the same sheep. So basically, uh, as I've said before, I'm a bit disappointed in the model. It works maybe less than half of the times you expect it to work. Plus you have these annoying thresholds, which probably are quite good if you want to maximize your metric on some data set or just find the one specific threshold that works for a blog post. But then when you actually start to work with that, you can see that it doesn't work as well and the overall quality is not that good. Nevertheless, I think the model is really interesting uh, and a great potential, uh, at least from the research perspective, maybe for future models. Next, let's talk about the very beginning of the model, the backbones, the image backbone and text backbone, and how all of that is fed into the transformer. So coming back to our diagram of the entire model, basically we have input text, input image, so we apply input uh, backbone for image called Swin Transformer to get some um, image embedding representation. And then we apply BERT model to get the text embedding representation. So let's take a look at how that happens. To do that, um, I first need to set the breakpoint. So the um, start of the model is located in this graph module. I have to find the forward method of the grounding dino class and then just put the breakpoint at the very beginning. Uh, and I also remove this one here. Uh, and then we can just click debug cell again and voila, uh, we are in the model code. Um, so we can just quickly validate that the input is still just the text, just the image. So this is the, the image uh, and the text is part of this KW object, uh, and it's just the text for now. Um, so let's see what happens next. So the text model for the backbone is called BERT. We're not going to read the BERT code itself, although I do have the video about that, as well as the Swin Transformer, if you are interested. Uh, then we just do tokenization, um, and we get some tokens out of that. So converting the actual um, text that we had as an input to token IDs. Now, part of the BERT architecture are also so-called token type IDs and attention mask. So token type IDs are basically needed if you have different segments of text. For example, in question answering, you'd have the question and then a text that um, you need to read to answer the question. Uh, and so they are separated by the special SEP token, and that is used as um, to, to separate different token type IDs uh, 
uh, and that is used explicitly by the model. Uh, in our case, we're not going to use that, and all token type IDs are just equal, so we're not using segment embeddings. But we do have a special attention mask that we are generating right here in this generate masks with spatial tokens and transfer map. We can see what these special tokens are. And let's see how they look like uh, after. Detokenization. So they are CLS, SAP, dot, and question mark. So this is the quick slide from the paper about what, what these masks are. Uh, basically, we want to feed in multiple prompts to the model, which is extremely useful if we're doing open set object detection for something like Coco dataset, which has 80 classes. Ideally, we want to pass all 80 at once to just perform inference for all eight of them in one go. However, all of them are going to be fed into the text model. And so we don't want to confuse the model into thinking that we see all of that and just try to interpret that as a text. Uh, and we, because of that, we basically separate the attention of these groups, saying that this is, in fact, its own text. This baseball glove itself is its own text, and a cat is sleeping on a table is its own text. And we set attention masks such that all the tokens in this sentence, for example, only attend to themselves and do not look into tokens from other pieces of text like this one. So we're not going to read this function. Uh, I hope it's pretty clear what is happening here. And the output of that are just ready tokens. And from these uh, special tokens list, you can understand that basically yeah, dot and question mark are mainly used to distinguish that. Uh, and then you basically just iterate over text and um, generate the attention masks. And so let's just print the result of that. So it's a huge tensor shape of that one by nine by nine. So we had nine tokens in the original input. We don't care about all the attention for padding tokens, so we are only care about the nine of them. And you can see here that, uh, let's just remember the original prompt that I had. The original prompt was ship most to the left. Um, so this is not really an interesting example because it has just one sequence, uh, one segment. So let me just put the breakpoint here once again, and then just restart it with a different prompt. So maybe a ship, a dog, a car, a pizza, right? Let's go with that one. Right, so now let's make sure that this is what the prompt was. And this text self-attention masks um, is now an object of length 14 by 14 basically telling each token where it is allowed to attend to. Um, and then if we look at where the first token can attend to, so the first token is probably just the uh, CLS token. Let's confirm that, right? So the first one is the CLS token. The next one is going to be a ship. A ship dot a dog dot and so on right so let's try to interpret this attention mask so we get the first element from the batch the very first one is cls token it just attends to itself not interesting and let's see the next 10 for example right so the first three correspond to a sheep dot right was it a sheep a ship dot and we can see that they attend to the first three as well um, skipping the first one so a ship dot a ship dot a ship dot and then the very next token attends to the three in front of that so that's a dog dot a dog dot a dog dot and so on you can see the pattern um, so then we basically get this as um, as a bird input it's thankfully we didn't have to write any custom code to do that because 
BERT interface already allows just passing in custom attention mask. Uh, and we pass that to BERT. So we have input IDs, token type IDs, just zeros, attention mask, the quite complicated one, and then position IDs. So position IDs, basically because we had this separation of one long sentence, uh, sorry, one long text into like four different texts corresponding to a sheep, separately a dog, and so on. Now we also want to fix position IDs because we don't want uh, Bert looking at a pizza, for example, to think that it's a pizza, but then somehow in the end of of a text, not in the beginning. That's why we basically restart the positional IDs. So really passing a pizza as part of this complicated prompt is the same as passing just a pizza on its own. Um, and then we pass that to BERT. And the BERT output is, so it's a object with a variable called last hidden state, which basically represents this token output, the embedding output of the sequence after all the uh, transformer layers. The shape of that is 14 by 768. So um, I just confirmed that our token sequence, input token sequence had length of 14. And so we get the same length out of BERT model. And then the hidden state for BERT model is 768. So last thing that we do with the text input is that we pro project the 768 uh, dimension to uh, the one that we need. Uh, I think 256, let's just confirm that. Um, so the shape of this is Fourteen by two hundred fifty-six, and we project that using. Let's see what we use for that. Just a single linear layer, so all quite simple. So we get this um, BERT output. Project that. Um, we save that to the special text dictionary object, um, and this is basically what is being passed down. Here here to the actual transformer call, right? That was the first half of the text. Now we also need to do something similar with the images and it's all happening inside that non-discrete self.set image tensor call, which basically just calls backbone, getting back um, actual backbone outputs for the images, the processed versions of the image, as well as the positional encoding. Uh, so let's just continue to that and see what the result of that is. So again, we were sell, sell, saving that to cell.features. Um, the first element of that has the shape of nine, 192 by 77 by 167 um, and we get three of those so second element slightly different and then final element slightly different still so yeah what is happening here is this one is basically the feature dimension now and this one is image dimension. And you can see that uh, like this first feature map that we get has the highest resolution and then the smallest embedding size, then slightly lower resolution and a higher embedding size, and then the highest embedding size, the lowest resolution. So this is basically corresponding to this multi-scale input where we had our initial image. Once again, our backbone for image is Swin Transformer, which divides that into patches. 
performs a series of so-called shifted attention window operations, basically for image processing, and then patch merge operation to scale down the resolution while increasing the embedding size. And all of these will be passed into the transformer. So not just one scale, but several, like three in our case. Uh, but actually, in addition to those three, uh, if we count how many scales actually come to input, um, num feature levels is the one we need. We actually have four here. So we have three different feature scales that we got from the backbone, and we want four of them. So what we do in this cycle is we just apply the input projection for all the existing three levels. And the type of that is just module list. Let's see what exactly that is. It's some it, it's defined somewhere above here in the initialization. We can actually just print it. So it's a module of a sequence of um, yeah, basically each of these will downscale or upscale the embedding size, right? So we had uh, the highest resolution image had embedding size in 192, and we upscale that to 256. We also have a group norm. Then for the second layer, input, input dimension, input embedding dimension was different. Output is the same. And then the last one, different still, output is the same. Um, and then what we also do here is we just use this projection to get the final fourth one. Uh, and we just get it by taking the third projection that was output of the backbone and just apply just final resolution, uh, final convolution to that one. Um, and we, we get our output. This is the way to like bootstrap, create the fourth scale that is even smaller than what we get from the backbone using our own means. And then all of that, let's just quickly continue to here. Um, so all of that is being passed to, to transformer. So by now, this SRCs are just four levels. So it's not flattened out yet just four individual uh, levels, each with slightly different input resolution. The actual resolution in Swin Transformer is not fixed, uh, so it will depend on the actual image. And then all the levels are slightly different in resolution. And then all the text information is passed as part of this text dict object. Uh, so we'll read the actual Transformer code in a bit. I just want to scroll down a little bit to show that this is pretty much the end, right? So this is where we return. Uh, the only other interesting thing that is happening here is getting this output. So to get the, so we get this um, output tensors from the transformer, um, and then we project that down using our layer self.class embed. And self.class embed is a model list, and each of them is a contrastive embed. So this one we will end, we'll read toward the end. So contrastive embed is the way to get the logic prediction, having the token sequence output from the transformer, having the text token sequence, and basically calculating dot product between them to get the logits. Now we'll be reading the actual transformer code itself. The first thing on the path will be the multi-modality teacher enhancer. And before that, we also need to flatten out all the inputs. So we'll see how it works in code, but first quick reminder how it works in, uh, in theory. So this is the diagram for multi-modality feature enhancer. So again, we have an image that was already passed through the image backbone and then flattened out and then we have text passed through the text backbone, BERT, and again, we get the flat sequence of embeddings. Uh, and it's typical for deformable attention, which is the case for grounding dino, to have really long sequence length for, for the image. So it's something like 20K elements, and then let's say 128, although in our case, it's just 14 uh, for the text input. 
So what we do next is, as usual in the attention, we project both the sequences into three independent embeddings, the query, key, and value. Uh, and in this case, we take query from the image. Doesn't matter, really, it's quite symmetrical. We take key from the text. We calculate the dot product between uh, between those two. So one way to think about dot product is that it cancels out some sort of dimension. And in our case, we cancel out the common embedding dimension. And so we get this 128, the text sequence length by 20K image sequence length and tension matchings. So it's not square. It is basically this large triangle uh, which shows the attention weights between all the elements in the text to corresponding elements in the image. Then we use that matrix twice. So one time we project the images down to values, again with the 20k sequence lengths, 256 embedding size, and we multiply these two matrices, this one and this one. And so this multiplication um, will cancel out this common dimension of 20k yielding dimensions 128 by 256. And since this 128 is basically the text input sequence dimension, so the output that we get from here is the text out, right? So this is a little bit tricky because you got values from image and multiplied by something, by some attention weights, and you get text outputs from there. But it's actually quite common. This is exactly the same as is happening in all the object detection models in the decoder. Um, it's just basically a decoder which was mirrored to get the text as well and then applied basically twice. And then the text value is the same. So we get the text projection 128 by 256 multiplied by this attention matrix. Now the text dimension gets cancelled out and we get out the image output. And overall, image output, text output have the same shape as inputs. So we can stack as many layers uh, on top of each other as we want. Uh, and we also have self-attention, uh, some feed-forward networks, uh, residual connections, all of that. So let's see how it looks like in code. So I'm back to my grounding dyno code. Now to set the breakpoint in the actual transformer, we need to find how it is initialized. And it is down here in this file, grounding dino.py. So it's constructing this build transformer and it's just called transformer class. So this one is, it has a lot of initialization for encoder, encoder layer. This P attention block is part of our cross modality feature enhancer, decoder, decoder, and so on. Let's just stop with the forward method and just see what is happening. So I have to restart the session and here we are. So let me just validate that the input we get are exactly the same as we saw before. So four image scales, um, I haven't really seen positional embeddings. So let's just print out what that is. Again, that's, there's going to be four of them. So three of them we got out of the backbone basically sine cosine embeddings for the specified uh, image dimensions. Then the fourth one, again, we quickly saw that in code, but haven't really discussed. The, we got that one from just applying the positional encoding uh, part of the backbone to our new reconstructed fourth uh, image layer. Uh, all the caption information, the BERT encodings, are in this text dictionary. And let's see what happens next. So this first piece of code, we have to basically flatten everything out. And before we do that, we also want to remember in which level this pixel, this token was laying. And so we have this special positional, uh, sorry, special level embedding. So level embedding um, is basically constructed as uh, self.levelPos embedding uh, called with the level index. So let me guess the type of that is parameter. Right? So this is just giant matrix. We indexed actual level 
IDX into this matrix, thus getting a static um, embedding of size, I believe, 256. Oops, so we have four 256 long um, level embedding vectors for each of the four layers. Um, so yeah, we basically iterate or all the input image scales, flatten them all out, append that to the final sequence that we have, uh, and add this level position embedding. So let me also quickly find the... Oh, actually not. We do not just add them. We just construct them independently. So we have this content sequence uh, level and positional embedding sequence and we pass that to the actual decoder so let's just quickly iterate here and just print out the shapes so src.flatten this is now our giant enormously huge um, sequence for the image input and it has 60 17k elements and the same embedding size and then level positional embedding, I believe should have the same shape because we basically have this embedding for every input pixel. So, uh, I don't know, a quick reminder of where this 17 key is coming from. So we had four input um, scales of different resolutions. So the first one was 77 by 167, second one, slightly smaller and so on and so forth. So you basically flatten this out, uh, multiply these two numbers because you're flattening out and you get one long dimension instead of two, uh, um, two numbers uh, and you sum them all up. So you basically get 77. Let's just validate that it's true. 77 times 167 plus 39 times 84 plus 20 times 42 times plus 10 times 21. And that's where we get the 17k. This is like flattened four layers all in one big row. Next we enter the actual encoder. So it is also initialized somewhere in the init method. We have transformer encoder layer and transformer encoder itself. And again scrolling down to forward method, putting down the breakpoint. And let's continue until here. Um, so here we will basically see um, we generate some positional embeddings for the text again. Uh, that's interesting. Um, then we basically iterate over all the um, layers of the encoder. Let's see how many there are. Six of them. So we start with the fusion layers. Fusion layers are exactly the cross modality feature enhancer layers. Um, somewhere you see this checkpointing. This is the technique to save up some memory. Um, basically, if you, if you don't do checkpointing and just do one call after the other, then the entire calculation constructs one big graph saving all intermediate results so that you can compute gradients during backprop. With checkpointing, you're basically um, trading CPU for memory or compute for memory, GPU compute for memory, by not saving all the intermediate steps and instead saying that I'm saving step number one and say step number 10, um, which is enough to get the output, but then you'd have to recompute the nine steps in between, which is like, again, uh, you spend more compute but less memory for storing them. Um, then you have text layers. Text layers are basically text self-attention and then the final image self-attention layer. So first of all, let's look at what these are. So fusion layers. The first one is this by attention block. So this is the cross modality thing. Uh, text layer is um, just normal encoder layer with multi-head attention, but we'll look at that one in detail as well. And then the normal layer is just deformable transformer encoder layer uh, with deformable attention, uh, but basically yeah, this is again self-attention. So let's put the breakpoint somewhere in the most interesting one with in the, in the by uh, attention layer. 
by attention block and see what happens. Okay, so um, we can see that the foreign method applies some layer norm, then the actual attention is proxied to this by multi head attention. So we basically should look at that one instead, and then this drop path uh, call. So the drop path uh, here it is imported from this team library is a thing uh, that applies stochastic depth. So I have seen it before in, I think, Swin Transformer. Um, so um, I'll just put, put the link in the description because uh, I don't want to stop too much on that. But basically what drop path or uh, stochastic depth does is like lengthwise dropout. So dropout itself uh, is a popular technique which basically throw away some coordinates um, in, in the width. So if you have 256 uh, coordinates in the layer, some of them in, in the output, some of them will be randomly zeroed out, right? So you effectively reduce the width of the model only during training. Uh, stochastic depth or drop path is the same thing, but uh, with the depth. So you randomly zero out uh, entire layer uh, and thanks to the fact that you have this skip connection, uh, the rest of the network still works, but the network itself be becomes slightly less deep. And again, this is stochastic and only applied during training. So you have shallower network during training, and then during uh, inference, it's uh, as big as it is supposed to be. Uh, but again, most important stuff in this is in this multi-head attention. So let's put the breakpoint here and see what happens. Uh, so first of all, we have this V and L. Uh, and in case you forgot which one was which, it's quite easy to understand from just the shape. Right, so V, 17K sequence length, that's the image sequence, and L must be text. So yeah, L is just 14 sequence length. Right, um, so let's see what next. So what was it again? So V is the image, so we get this V projection, which is just a linear layer to project image sequence into the uh, value, um, sorry, into the query. And then similar thing for text uh, with uh, another projection for text, right? Uh, and then we get value V states and value L states. So basically these four lines of code can be interpreted as query that comes from image, key that comes from text, and then two values, one coming from image, one coming from text. Let's see what happens next. So another thing that we need to do with actual multi-head attention is reshape everything to have many shapes. So interestingly, this projection actually increased the embedding dimension x4. So we have now 1024 embedding dimension. And then we do this reshaping, right? So after reshaping, what has happened is um, we now have four. Um, I believe four is the number of heads. Let's check this. Yep. The number of heads is four. And then the embedding dimension is down to 256. Um, and we then do something similar with key states. Again, four by 256, and then value. Four by 256, and the second value is probably the same. So what we've done here is we started with a sequence, projected that down to query keys and two values from image and text, increasing the embedding dimension x4, but then dividing into four equal parts for four attention heads. Uh, this is not typical, to be honest. So mostly, multi-head attention is done by having the same embedding dimension, but then reducing the dimension of each head instead of increasing the initial dimension and then coming back to the normal one. But I guess this works just as well. Uh, so what we do next is get the actual attention weights. So this batch matrix multiplication is the one doing the uh, attention which basically just multiplies the matrices in, in a certain way. So we have this transpose here to make sure that the correct um, dimensions go away 
and we can see the shape of that. So this embedding dimension of 256 went away. So we still have our head dimension. So we actually have four attention matrices, not just one. And the dimensions of that are image sequence length times text sequence length. Um, then we do some normalization, clamping, some more rescaling, underflow, overflow. Then we check for attention mask. And since in our case, V was text, right? No, so V is, um, V is image, right? So attention mask for the image, in our case, I believe is just all false. So we're not really doing um, any masking. Yep. But during training, when you have a batch, uh, that means that some of the images in the input had different shape. And so what you will do is you will pad the images all to the same shape. So some of them will have this gray area somewhere on the side because it was padded to, to fit the maximum size within the batch. And that padding will be ignored in the attention using this image attention mask. Right. Um, then you do soft max. Uh, and you can see here that we basically have two uh, versions that originated in the same uh, initial attention matrix. So one of them, so both of them come from this attention weights variable, but then we had different rescalings and clampings for the text version and for the image version. Uh, and by now we have these, we, we, we finally convert them to the actual attention probabilities um, and apply dropout and compute the actual output, right? So the output for, I always forget, it's V is image, right? So attention output V, yep, this is the image output. And we got it by taking this attention matrix, which basically originated in, in this common attention matrix and multiplied by L states, meaning text states. Yep. And then we do the same for text output. So we have our attention matrix that originated from the same matrix multiplied by image values. And we get the text output. And that's it. So uh, what we do after that, so we had had this uh, 256 embedding dimension and four heads. We do the final reshaping to basically concat all the head outputs together. Let's just see the final result of that. Um, oh, and we have this out V projection. So the actual attention output was X4 the dimension. And then by applying this final linear layer we basically project uh, X4 embedding dimension to 24 back down to 256. So we, by applying this multi-head attention, we first expanded the embedding dimension X4, split it into heads, computed all the attention stuff, then concatenated it back into X4 embedding dimension again, and then projected it down to the original size. And so the output of right now is exactly the same shape as was the input. So. This is it for the uh, feature enhancer, the most interesting block in the network, I would say. So this is the one that actually allows text and image to communicate. So this communication is basically happening with the help of this attention matrix that we got from image and text multiplication, and then use that to get image out and text out. So this is a really good thing. Like I'm pretty sure it's used in a lot of cross modality models out there like GPT-4, uh, gpt 4 stable diffusion for generating an image from text prompt and so on. So this is this is cool stuff. It, it, it's so good to be able to just read through that, uh, debug through that, see all the outputs. Uh, so now let's come back up a level into our transformer encoder. So we've re read the most interesting part of it, diffusion layers. Let me just quickly go over that just to make sure that we didn't miss any important details. So self.text layers 
they are initialized somewhere here. Right, so this text enhance layer is initialized as transformer encoder layer. Um, and the forward method of that is quite short, right? So now, since we don't need to deal with like this uh, image to text cross modality, this is just dealing with text. So we can basically proxy the call itself to this pytorch.nn.multiheadattention module. Uh, so we don't need anything special. That's why the code itself is so short. So we just do query key projection. Um, we use SRCS value. We use positional embeddings. This self dot with bot embed uh, is basically adding positional embeddings to the um, content embeddings. Dropout residual this plus here normalization, some linear layers, all the typical stuff. Um, let's see what else do we have here. So we need this image um, self attention. Uh, and for that, we use deformable attention. So this one is a bit more complicated, but I have a couple of videos about that, about deformable data, deformable attention. And it has been used in a lot of model scenes like DAP data, Dino, uh, DN data, and so on. So again, not stopping there. Um, again, you can see that the code itself is pretty simple majority of it is forwarded into this MS deformable attention block. Main difference of that one compared to the normal attention is that it's not quadratic in complexity uh, with respect to the sequence length, it is uh, linear. And so we use deformable attention in the places where quadratic is not affordable, where we need self attention between image sequence and image sequence. So 20k image sequence squared is too much. We use deformable attention. 20k times 14 uh, for text sequence length, that's fine. That's not so bad. That's why we use full pairwise self attention. Uh, for just text, 14 sequence length squared. Again, that's also fine. We use full uh, pairwise self attention. So um, I should remove this breakpoint and I want to come back a layer still. Um, so we've just gone through the encoder. Um, let me find the transformer itself. So we've been here through the encoder. So we've just seen one layer, but all of them are pretty much equal, thanks to the fact that input and output are the same. And so the next thing we see here is this language guided query selection. So this is it. Uh, let's take a look at how it looks like. So I'm just putting next breakpoint here to sort of fast forward uh, to this part. Um, so the output of the encoder is memory and memory text, basically image and text outputs. So memory is again the same shape as we had the input, uh, text memory, memory text. Dot shape. Again, the same shape as text input. So next, we need to generate output um, queries for that one. So let me quickly show the diagram. So first of all, why do we need that? So we have this decoder that receives some sort of queries as an input. So we've just gone through this feature enhancer. So we are here right now. We got our text output. We got our feature output. Now we need to come up with the queries for the decoder. And in different data-like models, um, there are different ways of doing that. Simple one is to just statically initialize uh, queries and use them as some sort of trainable parameter. Uh, another technique is to generate them from the encoder dynamically, which means that we can actually adjust the queries based on what we see in the picture. And not just what we see, but what we were asked to detect. So this is where uh, cross-modality language-guided feature selection comes along. Uh, and so the way it works is we basically have the encoder output and we try to predict the actual objects. So this part works exactly as the final head of the model that performs the actual predictions. Uh, but instead of just using that as a prediction, we use that to generate the initial proposal for the queries before passing that to the decoder. So the way it works is we have our text sequence. 
uh, image sequence. So I still call them text sequence and image sequence, even though they've already passed through this cross modality feature enhancer. So text tokens actually contain a lot of information about the image now. Image tokens contain a lot of information about the text. Uh, and to get the actual prediction, so prediction is basically uh, like in normal models, not in grounding dino, the prediction would be bounding box coordinates and class probabilities, right? That obviously only works if you have fixed set of classes. In our case, we do not have a fixed set of classes. Instead, the stuff that we need to predict depends on the text input. And so instead of this fixed uh, projection for class probabilities, we use yet another dot product, basically multiplying image output with the text output to get these probabilities of, of highlighting specific parts of the text. So the way it actually happens is we have our image token sequence. We project that down to um, our embedding. We multiply it by a similar embedding from the text side, uh, and we get our text token logits. So this one is saying that we had 20k pixels in the image. I want each of them to predict some object, where by predicting some object, I mean that I want every pixel to say um, probabilities for each token in the text input. Basically saying that, are you detecting dog or a dog most to the left or something else? based on the input text. And so we have these text token logits that we got from just calculating the dot product. Uh, and they already correspond to the detection probability, basically. Um, and then we select top 900 of them. And these selected ones we use to generate bounding boxes. So let's see how that looks like in code. So first, we have this GAN encoder output proposals. Um, this is a quite complicated function. Uh, I will not really read into that. But basically what it does is it converts relative predictions that we get for each pixel into the absolute frame. Because the final um, goal of, of this exercise is to generate bounding boxes. And we always deal with bounding boxes in absolute coordinates, meaning that we're saying that the bounding box starts somewhere here, 30 pixels uh, down and 40 pixels to the right from the uh, up upper left corner. And then the size is this and the height is this and so on. So this is what we mean by the bounding box. Uh, however, the encoder weights, the actual parameters used in the layer, they don't explicitly use the position that they had. So they basically have the same parameter for calculating the output for every pixel. The only difference in, in the output comes from the positional embedding. And because of that, it's really easy to predict relative stuff, like is the bounding box starting to the left or to the right uh, from this pixel or not, rather than absolute uh, to the right, left or to the right of, of, of this top left corner. Because of this, we need to convert this relative prediction that we get from the encoder into absolute coordinates. And so the code for this one will basically have some grid stuff, uh, lint space and uh, grid to convert this pixel position um, into some addition that we have to apply to convert relative prediction to the absolute one. Um, so let me just scroll through that. Then we convert, um, so we have our image sequence, image token sequence. We have this self dot encoder output, which is just one layer. It's basically projecting this 256 and embedding down to 256 again, just, just to be sure. Um, and then we have this enc out class embeds thing, right? So the class of that one is this contrastive embed. So contrastive embed is the one that will do the dot product to get the actual text tokens. Let me just click quickly find the definition for that one. And there it is. Right. So it's rather short, thankfully. So let me just break here and continue to that one. Right. So let's confirm input shapes that we got. So X is the image sequence. 
text dict is basically the sequence that still contains the um, token output for text as well as the masking and positional IDs. So Y is now this encoder output for text. And we can see the sequence length of that. And then we do this matrix multiplication. So this uh, at sign here uh, denotes matrix multiplication. And we can see how it works uh, by just printing out the shape, right? So we got rid of this uh, embedding dimension, getting the image sequence length times text sequence length output. Uh, and it actually is exactly the same as attention calculation uh, that we had in, in the attention minus the uh, softmax and normalization. And this is basically what we return. Right? So the only thing that we change here is we, we had our shortened input sequence because our text was actually smaller than maximum allowed sequence length of 256. And we just expanded it up to 256 because it's easier that way. So let me come back to where we were. So we were here calculating this contrast of embeds. So let me just break here and continue, right? So uh, this output of uh, contrastive embed, the dot product, right? Let's print the shape of that one more time. Uh, this now tells us the probability of every pixel of predicting, uh, of highlighting the specific part of text in the prompt. So then we have this one max function, which basically collapses one dimension, uh, resulting in basically the maximum probability of highlighting at least something in the text. So now this thingy ha here has the same dimension as the image sequence. And it is basically saying the probability of this pixel detecting at least something. Uh, and here is how we uh, get the bounding box out of it. So it is unselected. So we're not selecting top 900 yet. We just project everything using our bounding box embed, which is just small MLP. So a couple of linear layers, that's it. And then we have this top K proposals. So PyTorch.topK basically selects top K, which is 900 uh, indices uh, out of this and selected logits, right? So the probabilities of every pixel of selecting at least something. Uh, and then we basically having these indices, we index our bounding boxes using these indices, getting 900 um, bounding box uh, predictions, right? And now we have 900 uh, times four, four numbers for X, Y, width, and height of the bounding box. Uh, and so similar to Dino, we also have this thing called mixed query selection. So bounding boxes for the queries come from the encoder output that we've just selected, top K, top 900 bounding boxes, while content embedding is just statically initialized, meaning that it's static, not dependent on the image, uh, trainable parameter. And we should be able to see that in the code as well. Right, so this one is true. So we are initializing our target, which is a content part of the decoder query input uh, as just target embed, which is just an embedding. Um, let's just see that nothing else uh, surprising is happening here. And the very next thing is calling the decoder. So now let's take a look at multimodality decoder. So once again, here's the diagram, started with text, image, passed through the backbone to get actual embedding sequence that got passed through the feature enhancer, getting out the same embedding sequences, but now more processed and with a lot of exchange of information between image and text. Then we've gone through this language guided query selection, which basically selects inputs to the decoder based on what we've seen before based on encoder output and the actual text that was used to the prompt. And the very next thing is the cross-modality feature decoder. So here is the diagram for that. So as an input, we have 900 queries, which can be thought of as just experts who look at the image, talk to themselves, look at the caption, and try to understand what is happening. Uh, so we'll have self-attention, 
just normal pairwise attention between query embeddings. We'll have image cross attention. This part is exactly the same as you would see in previous models, like deformable data, for example, uh, with normal image cross attention. And then by just replacing the image features with text features, uh, you get the same cross attention, but now with text. So it is all quite similar in nature. So in cross attention, you get query from this query export input, and then key and value from the features, what, whatever they are, either image features or text features. Uh, and then you compute cross attention to get the output. So let's see that in code. So let me find the decoder definition. Decoder, decoder, there it is. I'm going to break at the very beginning of the forward method. Uh, once again, we can see that the main loop is basically iterating over the layers. Thankfully, layer input shape and output are all exactly the same, so we can stack as many as we want on top of each other. Um, what else do we have here? So we have reference points, which are basically input bounding boxes. We have target, which are basically input content embeddings. Before passing that to the actual layer, we basically have this query position, um, which is positional embedding. That is something that we've got out of bounding boxes. Uh, and then we call the layer. So let's, let's take a look at that in code. So this intermediate array uh, list is used in training. Unfortunately, Ground Intent had not released the training code, so we don't know exactly how it's used. But typically in models like this, it will be basically outputting output from every intermediate layer and connecting that to the loss. So basically the first layer predicts something that already resembles objects. Second layer predicts something that already resembles objects and is more precise than the first layer and so on. So ref points are our bounding boxes. We have 900 bounding boxes, four coordinates per bounding box. This valid ratios array is basically needed again only during training, because if you have multiple images in a batch, you'll pad them to the common maximum dimension within the batch. And so you have this gray area on the edge that you want to ignore. But because of this multi-scale thing, uh, because every pixel resolution different scale will actually be different, the percentage and the actual numbers of pixels that this gray area takes will uh, depend on which level you are on. So basically, I know you start with something like 200 by 200, and then you downscale a little bit, thus changing the proportion slightly of what the valid ratio for you is. But in our case, we can see that the batch size is one, so all the valid ratios are just ones. Uh, then we get these bounding boxes and basically expand them uh, using um, sine cosine embedding, thus converting that back to the embedding shape. Uh, actually twice the embedding shape because we have X and Y. Uh, and now somewhere here, the query post shape is 156. So query post, okay, so we had twice the embedding size for the positional embedding. And then this ref point had projected down to 256 again. So this is how we get back to the original 156. Another thing worth mentioning is the so-called attention modulation. So we are not just dividing this query input into bounding boxes and content uh, for nothing. We actually want to use the bounding box, which basically gives you an area within the image that is supposed to contain the object. We want to use it to modulate attention within the decoder. And there are two flavors of that. And previous model, Dino, uh, basically had option to use either of them. So one is just the um, modulated attention in full pairwise cross attention, uh, where you basically get this bounding box and you get the multiplication factor to 
increase or decrease attention probability in the uh, resulting attention matrix. Uh, here we use deformable cross attention um, because I guess we're not doing ablation studies in this one. We're just using the most effective thing. Um, and so let me just quickly switch to the slide with the deformable attention. So this thing comes from deformable data. Uh, you can see that the diagram looks pretty similar. We have our input image uh, processed to the backbone uh, yielding this multi-scale input. Then you have the encoder with basically refined representation of the image. And then the decoder with query input and some sort of interaction with the image itself. Now, to compute deformable attention, uh, either self-attention, image to image, or cross-attention, decoder query to image, you always need to deal with some sort of reference points. So for example, for image to image, you might be looking at the point uh, that is located on the head of, of, of this football player, and you basically choose the reference point in the second image, uh, which is obvious because it's the same image, so you just find the corresponding pixel coordinate there. And then from there to compute uh, deformable attention, you basically compute some offsets uh, to find out like three points or four points that you need to attend to. So image to image, that's pretty trivial. For query to image, that's less so because queries are not located on the image itself. They are in a different space, so to speak. So first you have to decide where to project them to. Right? So you need some sort of reference to find out like where to count the offsets from. Since we are interested in modulated, modulated attention, uh, we basically treat this bounding box as, as an initial reference point. So if we are detecting, I don't know, footballer's hat, for example, so we have some approximation of where that hat might be, then we compute its center uh, and treat that as a reference point. And then in other modifications that you basically have this sampling offsets that you multiply by um, the size of the bounding box. So basically the deformable attention weights themselves only predict like the offset difference. And thanks to using center of the bounding box as initial reference and size of the bounding box as the multiplication factor, you basically get this good approximation on where to look at based on what sort of object you are trying to detect. So this is what these target reference points are about. So we got them here, right? So it's 900 by four by four. So this four stands for the number of feature scales that we had. And this four stands uh, for X, Y, W, and H. So position and size of the bounding box. You can see here that we basically got, got them by multiplying by valid ratios. So in our case, valid ratios are all ones. So reference points for the first query, for example, sorry, the reference points input, they are all the same, right? The same bounding box because the, we do not have padding on the image. And we'll see in a bit how exactly that is used in the deformable attention. So quickly, let's go to the layer. So layer here is the transformer decoder layer, deformable transformer decoder layer. Let me put the breakpoint here, right, and continue to that. So now I have my target input, which is just content query input, target query position, which is the positional uh, embedding, basically, that we got out of the same four bounding box coordinates, expanding them into 256 using sine cosine embeddings. Uh, then we have self-attention, self-attention here, because 900 is not a big sequence length. We just use the vanilla PyTorch multi-head attention. Uh, then we have, and we basically use uh, content input, the target as query key and value with a slight difference that for query and key, you actually add positional embedding. So this with positional embedding call just adds content embedding to positional embedding, and the actual value is used without position embedding. Other than that, this is just vanilla attention. So the code is quite easy. So text cross attention, 
uh, again should be the full pairwise attention. Yep, the vanilla torch dot nn dot multi head attention um, because tax sequence length is quite small here. So the the small difference here is that for query we still use this target the content query input right with the 900 sequence length. And for key and value, we used the memory text, which was the text output of the encoder with 14 sequence length. And then finally, the cross attention. So self cross attention is this deformable attention layer. Um, let's quickly see that this is the end of it, right? So we cut the output, residual normalization, drop out, feed forward, and then we return that. And now let's take a quick look inside this deformable attention. the forward method of that. So now we have this query key and value. Key is not really used because we just always generate the fixed set of points to attend to. So query is our query input, uh, 900 times 256. And then reference points in our case are these four bounding boxes projected to every of the four uh, scales, so to speak. Right. So let's just quickly find where we use these reference points. So basically we have sampling, sampling offsets, which are just generated using this linear layer uh, using the query. So basically instead of computing pairwise attention by looking at the one thing, the query input, and another thing, the image pixel, and then computing all the pairwise dot products uh, for every of the 20k pixels, what we do instead is we do not look at the image at all. So we're not using key uh, in the formal attention. And instead, the, just look at the query and then compute the sampling offsets only using the query, which is a shift from saying that let's look at every pixel and then decide which ones we want. Instead, we decide ahead of time on only four pixels just based on what the query is seeing and then look only there, which is a huge compute simplification bringing it down from quadratic to linear complexity, but obviously you are losing something too. In order for that to work, you already need a lot of information from the image in the um, decoder input, which thankfully is what is the case here. Uh, and then to get the actual reference points, so we are going to be here, I think, right? So we have reference points, which have for, for every feature scale, they have four numbers, X and Y coordinates of the bounding box and then height and width. And so we get the first two coordinates, X and Y coordinates of the bounding box as the center. We add that to sampling offsets and sampling offsets themsel themselves are multiplied by height and width, which is basically saying that the this sampling offset prediction deals in like relative uh, offsets in respect to this point. And then we, in addition, knowing that the bounding box is big, for example, that we're trying to predict, we further multiply this offset by a certain scale, thus modulating the attention effectively. Uh, and then um, we basically do the deformable attention. So this was the decoder. So the final thing that I want to take a look at is the actual model output. Uh, although we did see the actual layer that does that already, let's quickly find it in the code. So I'm coming up a layer to the transformer uh, and let's just find the transformer itself, right? This one. Oh, sorry, that's the encoder here, this one. So we've just gone through the decoder, right? Let me just put the breakpoints over here and restart the whole process, right? So here we are. So we got the decoder output, the same shape as input. Uh, we get all the intermediate outputs as well. So the length of this object is six. And the final one has 900 queries, 256 embedding. Now, so this is actually a return from the transformer. So the actual prediction must be the part of grounding dyno model itself. Right. Let me just quickly open it uh, somewhere here. Right. So we are calling the transformer, putting the breakpoint here. Again, this HS object should be the same. 
six levels, 900 by 256, right? Um, so we do some conversion because some bounding boxes are without sigmoid, so we, sorry, with sigmoid, so we revert that to get the original bounding boxes. And here we get the actual output class predictions by, for, and we need that for level layers. For every layer, we apply this self.class embed, which is something that we've seen before, contrastive embed. So basically, right now we have 900 decoder query outputs. We still have our 14 text token embeddings after being processed by the encoder, by this cross modality feature enhancer. We compute dot product to compute the actual logits. So for every of the 900 queries, we will get the probability of highlighting every token. And this is what the model outputs. So let's just quickly iterate here and see the result. So output class, the last one is this 900 by 256. So 256 now because we had this padding. Um, this is easier, I guess, but we are uh, only interested in the first 14 of that. Um, so let me just show what the output for the first query is for the first 20 coordinates, for example. And you can see that, yeah, before softmax, so some coordinates are definitely not zero, and then last coordinates are always minus infinite, which gives zero after softmax. So this is the same as saying that, you know, this part will be, um, Yeah, this is better, sorry. So um, I'm taking the first element in the batch, the first query and the first 20 coordinates. And you can see that the first 14 of them are non-trivial and then minus inf before softmax will be converted to zero after softmax. So this was it regarding the actual model. Uh, it's really a complex model. However, uh, you can actually trace all the steps from the original data and then deformable data, DAP data, DM data, dyno, and then grounding dyno. So if you start small, start with just data, you can see that the code itself is the same, the same classes, the same overall project layout. And then if you start, if, if what you've seen today is too complicated, you should start uh, with first data, read that one, then read deformable data, and so on and so forth, thus introducing all of these concepts uh, gradually. Uh, so once you've read deformable data, dab data, and so on, dyno and grinding dyno, dyno will be much easier to understand. In addition, I want to advertise what else uh, do I have on my channel and what will come next. So we've just read the code for grounding dyno, which is almost the final model in the object detection series. I have a lot of videos about modern object detection. So I have a video about YOLO, um, the old school but still popular model. I have a video about the first foundational model using transformers called Data, and then a lot of uh, modifications of that that basically improve them little by little. Deformable Data, Tab Data, DM Data, Dino, and so on. I also have a video about reading the source code for all of them. Uh, I also have a video about grinding Dino. So this one was more about reading the code. The previous one was uh, more about the algorithm itself. Um, I have a video about GPT-2 and BERT. Uh, again, if you need to understand the text part of the model. Uh, and we still need to do the code editor, which is current state of the art. So if you know what state of the art is, you can just go to papers with code, object detection with Coco, and here you can see the entire history of everything. So data is somewhere here, um, not even on the top of the list because it's not really that accurate model. Uh, Dino, which is somewhere here, is a bit old now, uh, but it was first transformer-based state-of-the-art model that actually overcame um, stuff like regional proposal networks. Uh, then code editor is slightly better, so we are doing that next time. Uh, in addition, I want to do a little bit about object tracking. Um, and the first one I'll do is trans track former which basically branches off just the data model and uses this decoder queries and stuff like that to do frame-to-frame -frame, uh, 
object tracking. So it's a quite an interesting uh, idea, and I think it boosted the quality of object tracking um, techniques by a lot. So we have a lot to cover. See you soon.